And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Are we connecting? Please wait. My dog's coming over because she's, she's, you know, one of them camera people. She sees a camera. There's not a camera she doesn't <laughs> like. Oh, yeah? Oh, my gosh. She loves the camera. She doesn't get get on it. but uh, And we're across. We're waiting for a couple more pages to connect. Oh, but we are there. And we are back. Here I am, Fly Navarro, with the No BS World Tour. Coming at you eight weeks strong during the corona <laughs> close down of 2020. Filling up social media with no BS. Just a lot of good talking, a lot of positivity. And today I'm here with my man, Jack Vitek from the International Game Fish Association, also known as the IGFA. Jack, how are you today, my man? Doing great, Fly. Did How about I, yourself, buddy? Did, Everything good? Everything's great. Did I scare you? <laughs> no. Okay, I'm just checking because sometimes I've been known to scare people. I've been known yeah, to scare yeah. people. You're a little intense. Well, you know, there's only one way to start life, and that's by being intense. Um, that's it, man. Love it. So I'm getting ready to share this across a bunch of different pages. So while I do that, uh, tell us a little bit about your role in the IGFA. Uh, well, I'm sure I know you've had a couple of different groups on here, like every other kind of conservation group and people like that that work for small business. Everyone kind of wears, you know, a lot of different hats. And so I'm the, I'm the marketing director and chief of staff at IGFA and uh, just really try to make sure that the IGFA brand is, is in front of anglers and our brand is represented appropriately and uh, deal with membership promotions and social media and corporate partners and, and everything like that. So it's, it's a fun job. Keeps, keeps you busy. And, uh, you know, I, I started off at IGFA like 10 years ago. I came in doing Holy probably smokes. the coolest, the coolest job at the IGFA and that's being in the records office. So you get to see all the new records as they come in and, and talk to the anglers while they're, uh, you know, they're on the boat, they got a record fish or on the way in. Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that was that was a super cool way to to get started with with the organization, and and uh, it was a good good way to learn too. You know, I mean, that's all your rules, all your your kind of heart and heart and soul of the IGFA right there in the uh, the records and rules. So yeah, that was about ten years ago, and then now I'm now I'm doing all this stuff. So you, you've worked your way up. Ahead. Yeah, it's absolutely. kind of like like Captain Ron said, you get a job. You do the job right, you get a better job. And <laughs> I learned, Captain Ron said he learned that in the twelve-step program. <laughs> uh, that's there just, you go. I mean, that's just Captain Ron. I, every, if I can quote Captain Ron any every day, I'm doing good. Um, there you go. Wise words, man. Listen, that guy right there. We would all be so much more happier if we all lived by Captain Ron's rules. Uh, and I think I'm down to just a couple more. I can't believe how many groups, uh, as this thing keeps growing, I got more and more groups that, hey, share on our page. I already know the ones that tell me don't share on ours. Uh, I got, I've gotten slapped and kicked out of a couple of uh, groups already. I don't know why. I thought I was a nice guy, but not everybody wants to be around me. So, uh, oh, Joey Crawford is in the house. Good. If you want, if you want to do a, a shameless plug, this is the time to do it. Uh, Uso's in here. Louis Aldridge is in here. Good to see everybody. Let me uh, blast over here to these other pages. So, um, you used to work in the records department, but now you're part of marketing. And unfortunately, one of the problems with that is you got to deal with me a lot. Uh, <laughs> your phone starts ringing. Damn, it's that guy again. <laughs> again, yeah, man. Again with this, and we're back. Where is he coming back from, man? <laughs> what is You're persistent? This? You're persistent, though, but I like that. That's, that's, it, man. That, that's me. I'm persistent, nonstop. Uh, it's funny you put me on the do not call list, and I still find a way to getting unblocked. I don't know how I do that. Uh, <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about the organization itself. 
IGFA. Yeah. A lot of people, they say IGFA, and I, it, I'm i sure I'm going to get yelled at for this because I it, it came up in uh, Facebook the other day. And I jumped all over it. Uh, they said it was. We were talking about the hooking of two fish rule, and uh, they said, "Ah, that's only for world records." And I'm like, "No, it's it's not really just for world records. IGFA is more than just world records." So let's yeah. talk. Let's let's talk a little bit about what you guys do because you guys uh, you do have guidelines and I like to call them guidelines. They're really not rules. They're guidelines for fishing. So we're all fishing on the same playing field as we travel different places and different tournaments and stuff like that. But also you guys are conservationists and there's a lot of different things that you guys do. So let's talk a little bit about IGFA and what you guys do. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you you started in the right place, you know, with the rules and the records and stuff like that, because that's what people most, I think, associate the organization with. Um, you know, we've been around since 1939, coming up on our 81st anniversary here in June. Um, so, yeah, we started off as being the record keeper. You know, there are all these different groups around the world um, that had different rules, different record categories. Um, Game Fish Association of Australia, Avalon Tuna Club. Uh, British Tuny Club, all these different really prominent organizations around the world. Uh, and then we, IGFA was formed, you know, kind of on the, on the eve of World War II in 1939. And we became that governing body for the sport. Um, so rules and standardized, uh, standardized rules and records and everything like that. And, uh, you know, that was really, you know, conservation was always at the core. Um, you know, our founder, Michael Lerner, uh, worked with the American Museum of Natural History and he went on these incredible expeditions. I mean, you see him in, in the library when you come and visit IGFA, some of his books. And went all around the world catching these fish that people didn't even know existed at the time. And then, you know, had them, had molds made and brought them back to the museum and was like, yeah, that's a black marlin or that's a whatever, you know. Um, and just really blew people's mind at that time and, and really helped educate the world about uh, sport fishing and, 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 and everything out there. So, uh, as you know, it's like a lot of it with conservation is, is education. So. We've always had the conservation component that obviously continues today. Um, you know, we have our awesome satellite tagging program. It's been around for a decade or more, the IGFA Great Marlin Race, world's largest satellite tagging program. So we obviously still do a lot there, um, a lot of advocacy work. Um, and then really where we've kind of branched off and, and kind of started a new direction in the past probably decade or so is, is really getting involved in youth education, uh, teaching kids to fish, teaching the next generation of anglers to fish and and we have a variety of different programs with which we do that on a local level in South Florida and also on an international level, too. So, um, you know, it's just a, it's a, an ever-evolving organization, man. And we've been around, like I said, for more than 80 years. So times change, anglers change, angling changes. So it's our goal and our role as the kind of governor and authoritative body of the sport to kind of keep track of that. And, of course, I can't forget to mention being the historians of the sport, you know, keeping track of of records and, and important documents and important um, literature from the sport and photographs and things like that. So um, we do a lot, but we have a great staff. We have a great support team of members and trustees. So we get it all done. Now you, you skirted over a lot of stuff and, I, I, <laughs> and, and I'm glad you I'm kinda, trying to beat your record, man. I'm trying to get out of here before 56 minutes. There's no way it's going to happen, dude. I'm going to, I'm, <laughs> I'm so going to delve into so much stuff here. Um, first of all, uh, I'm glad you brought up the Great Marlin Race, but I don't want to talk about it just yet. That is like, okay. for, for me, it's like the coup de gras. It's one of those things people can really get involved in. Um, but I'm, let's, let's go back. First of all, you guys are the historians and you keep the records. Uh, I have a question here by Corey. Corey's from Oregon. And he says, what does it take to be a record-breaking fish? So, What does it take to be a record-breaking fish? Yes. So let's take any species. Let's just say uh, in Corey's world, uh, he's probably dealing with some kind of salmon or uh, trout. Let's say it's a, a, a steelhead trout. So um, number one, yeah. I, I don't want to go into uh, line classes and all that. Because that's a whole nother uh, thing. But number one, explain what it takes. It has to break a certain size. 
what it takes to yeah. apply for that record, so on and so forth. So, uh, and we, yeah. you and I have done this on video, but now we're talking live. So yeah. let's uh, let's break it down for everybody that's watching it. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, you need to break the existing record, you know, if uh, unless it's vacant. Um, you know, so if you're going for a particular line class record, uh, the heaviest fish based on a certain weight, so like the heaviest rainbow trout on two pound, four pound, six pound, eight pound line, whatever. Um, you know, so you would obviously have to eclipse that record by at least two ounces to absolutely replace it. Um, and then to document it, what you would need to do is provide photo or video documentation that shows, you know, the angler with the fish, the tackle, uh, the scale. You'd have to weigh the fish on a certified scale um, and, and provide evidence that the scale has been certified and is, is uh, uh, you know, accurate. Um, and then you have to, you know, send in your application and your tackle. So you actually have to send in your, your leader and your double line and your, and your main line. I mean, maybe you're not using double line if you're fishing for salmon or trout. Um, but if you're fly fishing, you have to send in your full fly leader. So you'd send all that into the IGFA. Um, and we would review everything. There's about four different people that are in the review process. Measure your leader, check your line. Uh, make sure you have all the pictures, get the testimonies, get the additional photos, anything that we may need. Um, and then it's about a month process and your record's approved. Uh, or on some situations, unfortunately, it's not approved. Um, uh, it just happens. So it's pretty straightforward. And, you know, a lot of times people, I think, get a little intimidated by it. But it's, you know, proper photo, video documentation, weigh the fish and measure it, and uh, send their tackle and a completed application in. So... Um, and then a whole over or underlying thing is, is that you got to catch the fish by IGFA rules, right? So you can't, you can't uh, be violating any of IGFA rules to do so, but it's uh, not too hard. All right. So I should have known I, I, I'm going to pick a species that is going to be controver controversial. So I said steelhead and it's, con <laughs> it's controversial. Uh, somebody's jumped in here. Steve Carson has asked. Is a steelhead a rainbow trout, or is it a separate species in IGFA's system? I, I did not yeah. mean to open up this can of worms, dude, <laughs> but I did. I Listen, yeah. I, I opened it up, and it's mel culpa. I, I totally, totally, totally did this. <laughs> it's my fault. I didn't mean to do uh, it. But anyway. You dog. So, uh, anyway. No, yeah, he's absolutely right. So, um a lot of people, I mean, steelhead, rainbow trout, they're, you know, same species, right? So they, they basically, it's, it, there's no genetic, uh, you know, it's the same genus and species scientific name. Uh, rainbow trout is, you know, uh, IGFA, you know, does not differentiate in our record keeping uh, between rainbow trout and steelhead. While a lot of the world does and, and recreational anglers have a very uh, different uh, opinion on that. But we don't we don't differentiate. We don't have a separate record category for steelhead now. No, so it it all falls underneath uh, rainbow trout. Uh, Dominic Lacombe Jr. thinks I should just plead the fifth and not say anything. <laughs> uh, I'm, listen, I, we have all. No, it's fine, man. It's a good question. It was a great Keep question. Keep them coming, man. Keep them uh, coming. Clemente is in the house. He's another fellow crazy Cuban. He's an MOT member of my tribe. Uh, he just joined in. Dominic's in here. Uh, Dominic is today's winner. Uh, he just uh, found out he reached diamond status, top fan for Fly Navarro fan page. Uh, he wanted to know what he wins. Uh, I let him know he wins taking me out to dinner. Uh, <laughs> check that out. Uh, that's what you win. Lucky you. Luck exactly. He didn't win. I won. <laughs> Lucky you. Our, uh, oh, you can eat buffet, dude. Golden Corral. Golden Corral. No, he said we're going to go to Zips. We've done that before. It's an Italian joint here in Jupiter. And uh, they make the best stuffed pizza. It's like a giant, like it's like a meat pie. Uh, there you go. It is, it's like a full deep dish pizza, but then they put a, a layer on top of it. And whatever you want in there, uh, it's awesome. Hold on. We have something coming in. From Bill Black, I'm not really sure which Billy Black. There's a, there's like four Billy Blacks that follow my page. I didn't know it was a very popular name. Uh, I don't know if this is the Walker's Key Billy Black. That's why I'm saying. Uh, over the history of the IGFA, are there fewer record fish being caught year over year as fish stocks are reduced? 
is our improved technology making it possible to land a higher percentage of bigger fish? Question mark. It's two separate questions. That's a good, both good questions. Um, you know, typically, you know, we've had a couple spikes in, in the total number of record applications that we see year over year. Uh, but I, since I've been there and even going back before that, you know, somewhere in the ballpark of four to 700 record applications a year, it's in that ballpark. You know, if you average it out over the past 10 to 15 years, I'd say it's probably 550, 600 on, on average. Applications. Um, you know, yeah, it's quite a bit of applications. And, and you, you would have years where you'd spike something like when we when we launched the all tackle length category. So it was a new record category. There are a lot of new applications coming in. Um, so when there's new opportunities that come up like that, or if we add a species, um, we get that kind of uh, spike. But year over year, I mean, we haven't seen any decline that I can say. I mean, there's, I haven't done a, you know the science and in looking into this, but it doesn't appear that there's a um, an overall decline in the number of applications or any kind of relationship with applications received and fisheries. Uh, status uh, that we've seen. I mean, certainly for certain species, you know, Goliath grouper being a great example, we used to get a bunch of records of those from from the Keys and everything, but then when they were protected, obviously that, you know, we haven't received a, a record for a Goliath grouper in, uh, you know, years. Um, and so, red snapper, obviously. So, as regulations change for species, yes, it does impact the, the kind of application of volume we would see for that species, but, um, other than that, kind of bigger picture, I can't really say with any any kind of certainty uh, to Mr. Black's question there okay, um, as far as with fisheries or anything. But but no, we, we stay busy, man, 500 or so uh, on average a year. And the cool thing, uh, the cool thing, which a lot of people don't realize here, I'll put this plug in there, is that over the past couple of years, nearly half or in some cases uh, more than half of all applications we receive are for fish that people have released alive. I mean, obviously, for the very few records we get for you know, maybe a bit a billfish or a tuna, in which we really don't get that many of these days because they kind of, you know, almost plateaued uh, in a certain sense. Uh, a lot of the other species, you know, freshwater fish and, and inshore species, people, and it's really cool to see anglers go out of their way to, to uh, you know, do the necessary steps to document these fish properly and release them alive. So, um, yeah, 500 or so applications a year is pretty about standard, you know. So, and it was funny because that was going to be exactly what I was seg segueing in, into uh, was what about a snook or a redfish that may have a season closed or yeah. a slot? How does somebody go about, uh, and maybe you can describe that a little bit. How does somebody go about not just the catching? You've caught a fish. It could be a potential world record, but season's closed or it's over slot. Yeah. How, how does somebody go about doing something like that? Yeah, well, let me give you a perfect example. There's a guy, I won't use his name, but there's a guy who's a really, really great fly fisherman, kind of like keeps himself up in the Juneau Beach area, um, a really sharp dude. Um, and he holds a record for snook, caught it from the surf, um, fly fishing from the surf. And it was during, I think it was during, it was closed season, right? So snook was closed, but he, this guy was dialed in probably during spawns, probably during summertime or whatever. So he was... He was finding his fish in the surf, casting to him, and he knew he had a chance at a record. So he, you know, got all his ducks in a row. He had a certified scale with him. Um, I think it was a, you know, we get t boga grips. Tons of people use boga grips to, to weigh record fish. Uh, this was, I think, a, a salter Brecknell, some kind of electric electric scale. So he had his place set up on the beach. He caught the fish, had everything there. Um, basically, hooked the fish, fought it, brought it on shore, took a couple selfies. I think there was someone nearby who took a picture with him. Um, I had like a GoPro on, so we got the, the footage of the fish. We could see it, uh, de-hooked it, had a, a sling or something like that, uh, or some kind of net, weighed the fish quickly. This is all like 30 seconds, this whole thing happened, because he was all ready to go. Weighed the fish real quick and then released it alive. So he didn't transport the fish, uh, didn't possess the fish. He just lifted it up, weighed the fish, and then, and then released it alive. Um, so a situation like that, when we talk with FWC, and, you know, on situations like this, when it comes up or whatever the local body is, and they're like, yeah, it's perfectly fine. Didn't, you didn't move the fish from A to B. I mean, it was all take, took place right there on the beach. You released it and showed them the footage and they were perfectly fine with it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a certain if you're going to go after a species like that with a closed season or, or a slot or something like that, you definitely have to have your ducks in a row. Call the IGFA, figure it out um, or go and um, 
uh, you know, talk with your local agency, your government agency, like the FWC here in Florida and say, hey, listen, what can I and can I not do? Because there's also been people that have had records rejected where they catch a, a overslot snook, put it in a live well. Um, the thing is healthy as a horse. They transport it, you know, back to the, the dock, jump out, weigh the fish and then release it back at the dock and it swims away fine. They tell the story and it gets rejected because they actually transported that fish. They possess it and they transport it. It wasn't just a hook, you know, measurements and then release kind of thing. So, okay, so um, we, uh, I, I want to stop you right there because there's two things that causes that fish to not pass. So I, I want you to really cover it so people that are not familiar with it. Uh, n- number one, this all falls under uh, IGFA says you have to follow all local and federal regulations correct yeah your 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 catch has to be legal okay so not only by idfa rules by any any kind of regulation that pertains to that species or the water that you're fishing in so the fact that if they would have transferred that fish uh that's where the violation is and causes it to get rejected Correct. Yeah. Transport. I mean, that's just a specific example in the state no, of Florida. No, I, I know. Or smoke, I just, you know, it, it's illegal to transport a fish that's over slaughter out of season. I so just, that's that's yeah. that's where that falls under. And I I understand that you understand it, but some of these people may not. The second right. thing that it falls under, uh, just so people understand, uh, why would you transport a fish under IGFA rules for a world record? You have to be on dry land. Correct. Yeah, so you can't weigh your fish at sea or on a boat or in a, a body of water. Um, but in, in, in like for the situation for like a snooker, the guy I said who caught the fish on the beach, he's there. You know, maybe he's in knee deep water, but he's standing on solid land. The issue is that you can't weigh the fish on, on a boat or any body of water because of the rocking of the boat to potentially you know alter the weight uh, and, and have impacts on the weight. So, but you know, just because you have to weigh the fish on land doesn't really mean for certain species. For some species, you can certainly weigh them and release them. We even had a guy, this guy's awesome, he, uh, this is several years ago, he was over in the Bahamas, he was, uh, he was catching tiger sharks and weighing them on a flat in, like, this giant tripod that he built and weighing them on a sling, getting a oh, weight. Oh, how awesome and is then, that? And uh, getting them on light tackle and stuff like that, it was pretty cool. So, re- weighing them and releasing them alive, so it was, it was pretty sweet, but, but yeah, there's, there's certain ways to do it, um. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta be creative. I, uh, I love it. And if I stop you, it's because I just want to dive into a little bit more description so people can understand. Um, and these are rules that I've been dealing with for. I've been fishing now for a living for thirty years, and I'd, I'd say I've been somewhat involved in tournaments and fishing them or directing them for the last twenty five. So uh, I, I see. I see the loopholes, and I know the loopholes that people are always looking for. Uh, I got yeah. Cut- well, hey, on that on that note, I don't want to cut you off. No, no, on no, that please. note, you said the loopholes. Like you said something that was, I think, was very interesting to begin here. You talked about how there are kind of guidelines versus uh, rules, and you know, you can argue that there are rules, but whatever. The guidelines. You hit a good point, though. You know, IGFA, we have these rules set out, and you know, it's a couple pages long, nothing crazy. But if we had a rule. For every single lure, or every rig, and every situation, I mean, it would be the book would be, you know, ten feet, you know, tall. You know, it'd be huge. So there is a certain underlying ethic uh, that goes behind all of these rules, and that's you know the theme of, of sportsmanship and and uh, you know a, an ethical ethical match between angler and fish. You know, like Hemingway used to talk about and stuff like that. One one angler, one fish. And fun fact: Hemingway was a vice president of IGFA for uh, more than more than 20 years until he passed away. So, uh, but anyways, uh, we, uh, uh, there are underlying themes or IGFA rules that it's, it creates a fair, fair match between angler and fish. And, uh, that, that kind of, that underlying ethic is what governs the actual rules. So yeah, I mean, uh, obviously there's some stuff that has to be taken on a case by case situation. Absolutely. And, uh, I was taught the whole guideline thing, uh, by Mike Leach, who used to be the president, his son used to fish with us. Because people would, uh, you can't do that. That's against the rules. Uh, well, wait a second. We're just out fishing. There's no rules unless you are either uh, fishing in a tournament uh, mm-hmm. where they are stipulated in the rules. Uh, these are guidelines that so we're all kind of on the And that's why I, 
Uh, when we're fishing a tournament, we're going by IGFA standards. This is what we're doing, uh, unless otherwise stated. Uh, sure. Um, so, and again, wording is just one of those strange things. Uh, I want to get to a question here that Steve Carson uh, threw out, which is actually a really good one. Uh, IGFA splits Atlantic and Pacific records for blue marlin, sailfish, and several, several other major species, but does not split bluefin tuna between atlantic and pacific is there a reason uh we do we do split between atlantic and pacific bluefin there, tuna there you go yeah so i mean uh there's there's let's think here we have bluefin tuna which is your atlantic species bluefin so that's uh thunus thinus then we have uh pacific bluefin as a, another species we have southern bluefin uh we have yeah, it's it for the bluefins. Um, and then, and then uh, long tail, long tail too. Yeah, so we have a we have a line class. We have an all tackle for, I think that's Thunus orientalis. Yeah, Pacific Pacific bluefin tuna. We have we have line class records. The, the all tackle record for that comes from New Zealand, okay. lady by the name of Donna Pascal. Um, and and there's there's quite a few line class records that the guys in Southern California set. Uh, Tom Flieger. Is a really really top notch angler over there. He's got a, quite a few records in SoCal. So, uh, yeah, we have we have records for we, we split them up between. Uh, what about yellow? Yeah. What about yellowfin? Yellowfin is is just is is yellowfin. There's okay. no Atlantic or Pacific uh, differentiation. Okay, I'm just, again. Uh, Steve says I totally apologize. My record book uh, does show it fairly new, and I missed it. Hey, Steve, this is what this is for. Uh, this no is, worries. this is, uh, yeah. it's, uh, this is why we do it live on Facebook and YouTube so we can interact, uh, unlike, uh, an article or unlike being on TV, we can interact with the audience and I'm sure you're seeing it. I, my eyes are bouncing all over the place cause I've got like four different windows open depending on, uh, which page this is on. And I want to make sure that I don't miss any questions. So, uh, also, just so you know, uh, and I don't want to scare you, Mike Myatt is on here. So, yes. he, he, he may, he may, you might say something and he may come back around and send you a text message. <clears throat> oh, man. I can't wait. <clears throat> I'm just, Perfect. Hey, hey, I'm just giving you a heads up. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Mike, great to see you on here. We got to get you in the no BS zone one day, Mike. Oh, you do, um, man. He's he's a much better interview than me, man. Way more entertaining. Well, way more entertaining. Here's sure. here's the thing, Jack. You are very entertaining. I've spent a lot of time <laughs> talking with you. I have to admit, from the moment we started until now, and it's been a few minutes, uh, you're calming down. That's a big deal. You're just calming down, and that's that's half the battle. I'm worried about my lighting, to be honest with you. Man. Right. I'm sitting here in my backyard. This is my new office. You know, my, my house has been taken over by my toddler. So I work out here in my backyard. Uh, you know, the the afternoon lighting has got me scared, man. So no, if I disappear, the, the, you got to let me know. Yeah, 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 I'll let you know. And listen, what you got to do is you might have to be on one of those swivels. So as the lighting goes, you kind of turn with it. Oh, dude, I'm on a swivel. For are, sure. you, are you really? Oh, sweet. Always. Always. Sweet. <laughs> uh, let's see. I see Alan Daniels in here, Mike Myatt. Am I missing anybody? I got a couple of them. Uh, let me go back a couple of pages. Uh, I don't see it on this page. I don't know. I don't know why. Should be on that page. Uh, Corey. Uh, oh, Oliver from uh, UK uh, is in here. Good evening, sir. Let's see. Uh, Corey says uh, you always call your local fish and wildlife office. Absolutely. Uh, let's see who else we got. Uh, Travis, Mata, Jack, are Bonitos big fish? Jack, <laughs> do you know? Do you know Travis? Yeah, for sure, man. I know Travis. Oh, okay, so he's, he's would pulling. you? Yeah, it's a tro it's a trophy fish. Travis. Is it, now, I mean, I mean, I don't know. Tell tell us about the Bonita runs where you're from. <laughs> are, are the do you have do you have a good Bonita run where you're from? Yeah, man. Yeah, man. For sure. <laughs> Little, little toonies, man. Come on. Little to You know, it's so funny you say that. I was just uploading all my NOAA I fish ID videos today, and I uploaded my little toonie. So I'm I'm working on all the thumbnails. Uh, there you go. 
Paul, good afternoon. Uh, you must he must he must be talking to you because he says good afternoon, gentlemen. And uh, God knows, uh, I don't know That's if I fall. I don't loose know. loose wor- uh, usage very, of the word. There. Very loose. Uh, yeah. Travis says you crushed the bonitas on yellowfin trips. I did, man. I did. I can't tell you how many times we used to run out of like Jupiter and and Stewart. Uh, usually like August September on these weekend trips. You know, and uh, try to catch tuna and, uh, you know, find the birds. We we'll always find the birds. And Travis would be on these trips. And, uh, you know, we would get in front of them, chunk like you would. We'd bring over all these sardines and everything. Uh, and we, we would we'd catch some blackfin. We'd catch, you know, skippies. And we'd catch, you know, these little tunny or bonita or whatever. But, like, we could never – we'd get back to the dock. And, of course, everyone was over there. You know, this is like five or six trips. Everyone's over there with their – you know, football is like 20, 30 pounders, you know, like at least it's something. A couple guys get some bigger fish, but yeah, yeah, we were Bonita Slayers, man. We uh, we can never figure out the yellowfin on those, those those Bahama birds when we'd make those runs across, but um, I miss those days, man. That was fun. That was a while ago. Uh, Travis, we need to do it again, buddy. Travis, it's time to uh, put up, put together a new Bonita run trip. Uh, let's see, uh, Mike. Uh, ain't no gentleman around here. What's up? <laughs> okay, so I, I got two people joining in. I want to say hello. Dave Farrell is driving and listening. You know Dave? From, yeah, for sure. Yeah. F- Dave, we need to get you in here for the Florida and Texas fishing report. Uh, I want to know what... Tell me when the sweet time is for the Bonita run in Florida and Texas. That's what I want to know. Bring us the real deal here. And also, I got to give a big shout out to my man Tarzan. I don't know. Did you see the podcast I did with Tarzan? Yeah. My man is 11 years old, and he's. I heard, this is just a rumor, he has not confirmed with me, but I got the text message. He caught eight blue crabs and two stone crabs today. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's rocking it, dude. Uh, and he says, I catch, but I catch bonitas off the beach in the summer. Uh, you guys take go out by boat. And he goes out and catches him uh, off the beach. He's styling. That's aggressive, man. Benita's from the beach, dude. That's crazy. Very aggressive. Uh, coming in late as usual. Drouse, what's going on, brother? Okay, uh, so your son is starting to work. So I'm just letting you know you're starting to get uh, – just everybody Uh-oh. know. He had the best lighting before, but the problem was uh, it was behind him. So – and – being that we're all working, oh look, my, okay. Who else here? That better? Oh my God! Why didn't you do that from the beginning? Okay, I want to raise. Oh man, look! I got this, this boring fence behind yeah, you, man. Yeah, but, but, yeah, yeah, but, but you know yeah. what? But now, look, everybody can tell you're a sharp dressed man. Before you were just sh- you were a shady character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I guess. whatever. Uh, somebody, Char- uh, Charles Levy, uh, Levi says, Ed Dwyer, other side tournament this weekend. Nice yellowfin out of Port Canaveral. Uh, look at Jack with the sweet spot. Look at that. That's from Mike uh, Gromley. Uh, oh, oh, here we go. We got a report from Cameroon. Alex from Cameroon. Tomorrow we go for Marlin, hoping for the 50 or the 80-pound line class Atlantic Blue Marlin. Wow. Good Damn. luck, buddy. Damn. Good luck. Get it. You did not. Would you, could you give him a little blessing or something? I I, I don't know what. Um, it, I, don't, I don't, don't know. Don't pass the rod. Don't pass the rod, dude. Okay, that's. I didn't ask for advice. I was just asking for a little blessing. Uh, oh, you know, course. good luck. You know, like shake and bake, or you know, maybe some shake and bake. There you go. Uh, or you can do a little uh, with whatever you're drinking a little there. Holy, a little holy water. <laughs> a little holy water. Uh, Oliver Taylor. Good evening, sir. Uh, we are fishing at last. Currently, sat on the bank with a beer. You know what? It's a big, like it's a big thing. A lot of people uh, finally getting to go outside uh, and drink some beer. And now it sounds like it's a little windy where you're at. It is, man. Yeah, like I said, this is my office, my my new office as of the past couple of weeks. Um, my backyard. I got like a two year old daughter and. Uh, she sees us in the house. My wife and I, we have to hide from her during the daytime. We got a nanny, and she uh, she helps out for a couple hours during the day. But, 
you know, if she sees us, she wants to uh, wants to play and crawl all over us. So I got to hide out here for a couple you, hours. You, you know, know it out. you should bring her in the no BS zone. This is family friendly, bro. This is family friendly. Man, There's no she would. But she's she's crazy, man. She uh, she rips the keys off my laptop and everything, dude. So I, it would be uh, she's like a Tasmanian devil or something. I don't know. Nothing, but, uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, big shout out to Zach McDonald from. Uh, Sportfish Daily, Joan McGilvery. Hi, Mom. Joan McGilvery is, uh, when I go giant tuna fishing, that's Curtis's mother. She's kind of like our, ah. she's like our dead mother. She makes us fresh haddock every three days. Every <laughs> three days, I'm having some fresh haddock. I eat more seafood when I go up there than any other time of the year. Uh, Alex from Cameroon says, ha, ha, ha. He will pray a lot tonight. <laughs> <laughs> And Charles, yes, I did see that 500-pound black marlin caught from a kayak. Did you see that in Panama a few months ago? Yeah, yeah. They're at the Los Busos, man. Those guys have been crushing it down there. We've actually got quite a few applications for them uh, for records, like a kayak lodge, right? Those guys are down there. And uh, uh, long story short, but there's a guy named Adam, Adam Fisk, I think his name is. He's uh, I met him several years ago. He works down there. He, uh, he actually, I think he still has it. He had the... Uh, Florida state record for Atlantic Bonita, like a true Bonita, not a little toony, you know, kind of deal, but a true, uh, a true Atlantic Bonita caught it on a kayak off of Lauderdale. It was like nine pounds, but, uh, he works down there now. And we hear from those guys all the time, uh, setting length records for rooster fish and cubaras and stuff like that. They're crushing it. So nice. Uh, I'm not a kayak fisherman guy though. I, I just, I, I've done it and, uh, man, I want to like it. I just, uh, man, I don't know. I, I get, you're like claustrophobic, like Chris Farley, fat guy in a little coat, you know? Uh, but I feel that oh, way in a kayak. Yeah, oh it's not, not made for me. You just went with Chris Farley, fat guy in a little coat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've flipped the number of them. I'd rather, I'd rather be on something a little bit more stable. So, I, uh, this has been a while. We talk about flipping over. Uh, where I live, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I butt right up against the Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge. And I would say, I think it was last summer, we all went on an evening paddle at the, at the refuge. And I was in the canoe with, uh, with my girlfriend. We're paddling. We're listening to all these different stories. Next thing you hear is some yelling. And then, splash! It's like, oh, my God. What happened? So you turn around, and there was this guy and, it, and his wife. They, they capsized in the canoe. Well, um... Needless to say, they're screaming. Everyone's got life preserved PFDs on, uh, personal flotation devices. They're screaming, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. Finally, the person paddles over and, and says, hey, just stand up. You're good. <laughs> just stand up. I mean, the water was like knee deep. Uh, it, yeah. re it really wasn't that deep. Anyway, long story short, the husband was being a wise ass, and he kept rocking the boat. And the wife got nervous, and next thing you know, uh, they flipped. So it happens. It happens. So I don't, I don't blame you. When I'm fishing, I'm fishing. Uh, oh, wait a second. Dominic Lacombe Jr. says you reference him, Chris Farley, or the fat guy in the little coat. <laughs> I referenced him or what? Yeah, you referenced him, the fat guy in the little coat. Uh... <laughs> there you go. Hey, you're just, welcome. just so you know, you're uh, – Every time when you lean over, I'm only getting half your face. And I want to see all of you. Oh, that's perfect. Not just me. Everybody here. Especially since you got the perfect lighting. Okay, by a, show, by a show of hands, who likes Jack's coronavirus haircut? I do. That's a great haircut, by the way. Uh, I'm voting for that. I'm definitely voting for it. I want to see people. And I want a real emoji or a yes or something. Don't just hit the like button. Give me something for real. Uh, Jack I tell you why you should like it, man. Is because I did it. I did it myself. Yep. <laughs> right here, like right in my backyard. I did it like a couple weeks ago. I did it. Uh, did it right here, and you know, I was like, you know, late February. I was like, you know what? I should probably get a haircut. But I had to go out. We had Fred Hall in California. I, I, I ran out of time, so I was out in California early March, and I came back, and then pretty much as soon as we came back, it was you know straight lockdown. Uh, everything, you know, you got to stay in, so I couldn't get a haircut. So I was way overdue. So it was a couple of weeks ago. I just had enough of it down behind my ears and everything. So I, I just went out in my backyard and 
trimmed it up, man. I think it looks all right. No, not bad. I, that was like a mirror, a little some scissors, and yeah, bada listen, bing, bada boom. I I have to give it to you. You did a damn good job. Me personally, I would have kind of stayed away from that. Uh, mm. Whoa, wait a second. I got. I have uh, Shell. She's in here. She says personally, I like the Frohawk. No, no, what? <laughs> Frohawk. It is. No. Yeah. The, I didn't even laugh for the Frohawk. Is the way you coughed it up. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh, that was awesome. Uh, all right. Uh, big shout out to uh, Pauline Bertolino. Good to see you. Uh, okay, so we've moved on from rules, regulations. We've talked about the massive Bonita run. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your conservation efforts. You guys have a lot of different conservation efforts out there. So yeah. uh, let's talk a little bit about them, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, man. Uh, so I guess we'll just let's just start with with what we talked about earlier. You know, the the Great Marlin Race. Um, Perfect. You know, this is this is something that I think it it speaks to a lot of recreational anglers. It's a citizen science program. That means it's you know you guys out there helping and helping do it. Uh, and and the the great marlin race is everyone's familiar with tagging fish. This is tagging billfish, but instead of a like a spaghetti tag or like a regular you know uh, traditional tag, it's a, a satellite tag. You guys are probably familiar with it. And now the tags we're using stay on for around 240 days on uh, a good deployment. So you get you know, more than half a year's worth of information, uh, such as diving depth, uh, actual track, you know, like, so where that fish actually goes. That's one of the things with a traditional conventional tag is that you, know, you could tag a fish off of Miami and catch it two years later and it's right off of Miami again. But in the meantime, that fish could have gone, you know, wherever, right? And you have no idea. So, yeah. You know, I mean, it, but, you know, spaghetti tags have their place for sure, but this is a different kind of thing because you get all this data of where the fish actually went. I mean, we have fish that were tagged off of, uh, you know, Puerto Rico and ended up off of Angola. So they, you know, you know crazy migration. So, and that has all this data that we've d done uh, close to like 500 deployments at this point. Um, you know, this is, you know, recreational anglers in fishing tournaments, uh, buying and sponsoring these tags at, you know, 45 to $5,000 a piece. Uh, you know they're 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 investing in the science and they're deploying the tags, which is really cool. So, um, you know the, the Great Marlin Race continues to, to be our leading kind of main uh, saltwater research initiative. Uh, and you know, we, prior to the COVID, and even we're still going to do some deployments this year. But we had we had a record number of, of tags scheduled to be deployed this year, like upwards of fifty plus. And uh, you know we're still going to put quite a few out but it's not going to be that big because of the, the complications but it's a great program and the data uh, that we gather from this is using it we're using it to inform policymakers to you know update fisheries management regulations and things like that so it's it's a really cool program and i mean and you get to see where these fish went i mean it's just absolutely insane um anyone that's ever you know grew up watching national geographic where they put the critter cans on fish and you get to travel with them and see where they go and the, and the tracks on these things are absolutely insane so you know, we have that program we have um our forage fish research program which is something that igfa has been spearheading here in florida uh but it's basically a a program that we're working with some other groups on to fund and, and raise funds and, and 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 uh fund graduate students to do research on so basically the state of florida has this backlog of all this data on uh bait fish pin fish forage fish things like that but no one they haven't really had the time to or the the resources to really analyze and, 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 and mine that data. So this, this program is allowing uh, these research students to do that and turn out some really uh, interesting paperwork about managing fisheries from the bottom up versus the top down. Uh, you know, so it's a really cool initiative there. Um, and then, you know, probably one of the things that is, takes up the most time that people don't really see that much is kind of the back end work is just, the constant advocacy work and working with other groups like, you know, ASA and and Wild Oceans and and BTT and TU and uh, TBF and all these other conservation groups is like the, the kind of behind the scenes work that all these groups do and the collaboration that we all do to kind of represent and protect the interests of recreational anglers. 
Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that, that everyone kind of has their own niche <clears throat> and, and the, the cumulative voice behind that, that when we all get together, makes a lot of, makes a lot of uh, impact. Like we saw with the Billfish Conservation Act that was passed through Congress, um, that we've seen with the work we've been doing in California with removing drift gill nets, um, an extremely archaic way of, of commercial fishing. Um, you know, it would kill dolphins and, and not dolphin fish, mahi, but like porpoise and, and whales and, and marine mammals, turtles. And we were able to successfully get that done at a state level and, and working on the local, uh, the federal level as well. So uh, just that general advocacy work uh, with the different bodies is, is a huge, huge undertaking. And, and so that, uh, that's kind of the conservation work that we do. And then the kind of the new, the new front runner, the new thing on the, on the radar with, with the research programs that we're doing is we've launched our Golden Dorado Research Initiative. So Golden Dorado, not to be confused with mahi or, or dolphin fish. This is the the South American, Argentina, Bolivia. Yeah. It's, on my, it's on my yeah. bucket yeah. list. I've Gold never fish, caught one. Freshwater. Yeah. No. So we're doing a, a program down there to kind of learn more about, I mean, these fish are, it's a huge, the past couple of years, the, the recreational market for these fish is just booming. Uh, people are traveling from all over the world to come fish for them. And, you know, before it gets too commercialized and too busy, we want to try to figure out a little bit more about where these fish move. I mean, they're all interconnected on these waterways throughout South America for the most part. And where are they migrating? Where are they moving? Um, you know, are they all the same stock of fish? Are they different stocks of fish? So doing fin clips and things like that to, to do a three-year study on Colorado to really understand that fishery um, is something that we just jumped into this past year. So, um yeah, it's it's uh, it's a full body of work, man. We uh, we always try to stay on top of it, and and uh, you know that's part of our overall mission. Is you know a lot of times the records and everything like that kind of overshadow a lot of the conservation work. But we're we're there, man. We're there fighting for the fish, fighting for the angler, just like these other groups. So we're uh, proud to do so. We've been doing it for more than eighty years, man. So awesome. Now yeah. I, another thing I, that's I know that you guys have a big initiative on. And I, I, I really want to touch on is uh, getting kids getting kids fishing. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, so we like I said earlier, man, we've been doing local camps, and we're, we're headquartered IGFA is headquartered in South Florida. Uh, we still operate out of our headquarters in Dania Beach. Uh, the museum's closed down, but so everyone's aware, our headquarters are still there in the same building. Um, Nothing changed there. But anyway, so we, we still do, and we we historically have run youth education programs out of that facility in Dania Beach. And, uh, um, you know, we kind of took a step back a year or so ago and said, listen, you know, all these other programs, you know, the International Game Fish Association, our acronym starts with an I for international. And when it comes to youth education, all we're doing is basically stuff in South Florida. So how can we take a step back and, and take these programs – and get them in the hands of our reps and our community around the world to make them truly international and have a, a global impact while not giving up on what we're doing in South Florida by any means. So that's what we did. And uh, we, you know, we celebrated our 80th anniversary this year, or last year, excuse me, in 2019. And, uh, you know, one of the goals that we announced and one of our initiatives as part of that anniversary is to, is to teach 100,000 kids to fish around the world. And we're more than halfway there. Um, and this Passports to Fishing program is one of the ways that we're doing that. And basically, long story short, is IGFA for years would have clinics at, the, at our headquarters where people would come and learn different things like how to tie knots and everything like that, a family fishing clinic. Uh, what this basically does is puts that clinic in a box and gives everyone who receives it the ability to, to, to host a fishing clinic. And you know, last year alone, we put out 50 of these things, and you know, thanks to our partners at Plano, uh, Rapala, uh, Bass Pro Shops, Mercury, all these people that have supported us, Fish Florida, um, who have supported us and helped grow this program. Um, 50, 50 kits last year, um, 21 different countries, I think seven different languages, six different continents. So these programs and these fishing clinics are taking place all around the world. Um, so it's a really cool program. We launched it last year. It is going nothing but up. The COVID uh, situation kind of put a little bit of a, a slowdown on sending these kids out, but um, it, it'll it'll be back again. It's not going anywhere, man. And 
our plan is to put out even more this year, double the numbers and, and keep, uh, keep educating kids. So, um, you know, it really, it's important, you know, I mean, we're spending so much time inside kids do these days and getting them outside and fishing is, is a way to, way to get them engaged. So I was, uh, I was actually partnering up with, uh, an IGFA rep, Raul Roca from Spain. Uh, yeah. him and I were partnering up to, uh, teach kids fishing at my tournament in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I was supposed to visit Raul in April uh, of this year. And then the tournament was supposed to be in June. This was all pre-COVID-19. So that kind of put a, a big damper on, on everything. And then at the beginning of the year, I was out uh, in Okinawa and I introduced uh, you to my friend Cam. And I believe you guys set him up with all the tools to teach the kids in both English and Japanese. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. We have all those materials, and our goal was for this year is to get it to ten languages. So, uh, I know I'm going to miss some. Leave some out. We got English, Spanish, French, uh, Portuguese, Italian, Japanese. Oh man, um, I want to say Arabic. Um, and a few other ones. Um, actually, I think that's probably it. And then this year we're working on a couple other ones, Russian, uh, a couple other languages. So um, it's it, the program's taken off, man. So the youth education component is strong, and and we're we're excited to keep building on it. So it's it's a great program, and it's a great way to bring the next generation up, uh, whether they've been introduced to fishing or not. Uh, it's it's still a great way to bring them up and teach them all the good things about fishing, uh, helps them connect with other fishermen in the industry uh, on a local level and then at some point on an international level. And then uh, it also introduces them to conservation uh, and protecting the resource. Absolutely. Yeah, these kids, I mean, these kids are learning how to de-hook fish and handle them and measure them to see if they're legal size and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's a really cool program, not only teaching them the basics of fishing, but you know, how to be a steward of the environment and, and, the, and the ocean and the lakes and rivers and streams. So it's all cool stuff, man. When, cool stuff. when are you going to start teaching your daughter the, uh, all the <laughs> ins and outs of fishing? I mean, here you are, you're with the IGFA, you are an actual office member. Uh, I, I, and listen, you can't just pass her for passing her cause she's your daughter. I mean, are you teaching her proper de-hooking techniques now? Are you teaching her pro proper species identification? These are very important things. She's going to be learning how to how to rig baits and leader fish and clean fish and clean the boat. Nice. All those important things that we all have to learn growing up, you know? I, listen, it's, it's made me who I am today. A little bit crazy, but it's definitely <laughs> made me who I am today. That's right. Um, no, no, man. I mean, that's... No, she's going to be outside, man. No, that's I'm, that's of that's great. And uh, one of the things I, I just want to skim over, and this has nothing, and I'm not trying to self promote here, but I think this is re a really big thing because I'm seeing a lot of young kids out there. Uh, we started an initiative, and I say we because it was something that both you and I uh, did together, uh, and I we both felt it was something that was our industry was going. Um, we started, uh, and I believe we're almost done, if not completely done, uh, switching over the rules in the IGFA from all written format to video format. Uh, so that uh, kids and adults and anybody who wants to learn about the rules as far as uh, whether it be for a tournament, whether it be for going after your own record, uh, they get the opportunity to look at it on video. I know you've been sharing them on all your email blasts. You've been sharing them on your YouTube, your Facebook. I know I have. Uh, but it was one of those projects uh, that uh, if you didn't fish in tournaments, you didn't realize that these were there were these guidelines. You had to, you know, if you want to be on the same standard, uh, you had to follow. Yeah. Yeah, no, we have, man, and, and, and kudos to you, man, many thanks to you. I mean, you say we're in for self-promotion, but, I mean, we've been talking about doing this for years, and you and I had a conversation, and, 
and you said, hey, let's film them. I'll show up two weeks from now, this date, let's do it. So you just made it happen. So I, you know, I appreciate you kind of spurring it along and making it happen. So, no, I'm, but yeah, it's, I'm a, I'm a pain it's like great, that. man. I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's, I think the coolest thing that the most important thing for me about this is that, you know, a lot of people get intimidated. They think IGFA rules are so onerous and there's, you know, way more involved in it, but it's really pretty simple for the most part, man. You know, it's, it's, it's basic stuff. You know, don't pass the rod. No one else helps you fight the fish. It's just you, uh, you know, Leaders can be this long, and max line is this it, and that's it. You know, for the most part, I mean, unless you're doing something crazy out there, I mean, people are probably fishing IGFA rules, and they don't even know it. And, uh, but you know, with your help and, and getting it filmed, you know, that's a that's a that was a huge help, and it was cool. Well, I know for me, it was definitely something I wanted to do because um, number one, uh, there's a whole generation out there that learns by looking at videos. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, I get so many questions. Uh, as of right now, I'm running five tournaments. That's looking like it's going to increase. Uh, and people are constantly asking me questions. Well, what do you mean uh, it's 30 foot? A leader has to be measured from where to where. Or what do you mean uh, my gaff can't be longer than eight foot? Okay, you want to know? Here it is. And at least for me on my YouTube channel, I don't know. And you have the same copy. These aren't just so people know. These aren't separate copies. Uh, yeah. We we created the videos, uh, and we just made duplicates. So you have them on your YouTube channel. I have them on my YouTube channel. But I know on my YouTube channel, they've actually people started grabbing them and putting them on tournament websites. Uh, That's awesome. And so uh, if rule number three says. Uh, whatever, no passing of the rod or uh, 30 foot length, here it is, there's the question. And I'm watching uh, tournament directors actually grab them and then text them off to somebody. And that's, I mean, that is, uh, at least for me, that was the ultimate goal, was not just to film them, but to keep them there as a resource for tournament directors, or fishing club members, or people that want to know and have uh, the ability to reach out literally to you, to somebody at the yeah. IGFA, to have them explain to them at a at a moment's notice. Is that a furball? <laughs> man, I tell you, what, I wish I had. I wish I had these videos back when I was in the records office, man. So everyone had these questions. Hey, what about this? Here's a link instead of writing it out, you know. And but no, they turned out great. I think you know they're. Nothing fancy, you know, it's just straight to the point. That's a I, minute, minute and a half, and there you go. So, I, you know, if we haven't covered one yet. Let's let's cover another one. Let's, uh, let's do uh, one until we get them all. So. No, no, no. And uh, I, listen, I enjoyed it. We had a great time. Uh, if nothing, we should do some more just for doing some more. Uh, I, yeah. lo I love doing videos. Uh, I, it's how the public gets educated. Uh, I was just talking to a guy today. He's a big filmer and this and that. And I'm like, listen, I... I don't do the story thing. I do the education thing when I do uh, when I do my videos. Okay, we got to stop right here. I have a question coming in. Fly, ask Jack about his first bonefish, and that's from Adam. Adam yeah. Kraken. Adam Creighton. Yeah, Adam Creighton. So I was at IGFA for a couple of years and got a bite from this guy uh, who owned a lodge in Turks and Caicos. I think he caught some records and I helped him through the process and everything like that and he invited me down to come fish at his lodge you know just you know put me up in a, a bunk and and uh, it was a nice bunk I'll say that um, went down there and and uh, it was like you know it's all fly down here and I had never fly fished in my life but I was like dude this is an awesome opportunity I gotta take advantage of this so um, you know I that was I think December or January and this trip was in April I booked the flight and everything so I went and Got a fly rod, and I'm not a fly, not historically a fly fisherman, more kind of blue water background and everything. So I was living in an apartment at the time in Florida here behind, you know, people who were here. I lived behind uh, Gallery Mall in Fort Lauderdale. And in and, and the evenings, I'd come home from work, and the back parking lot would be wide open. And so I would go, and, and I would take the fly rod out there, and I would practice, you know. And I didn't have a grassy space, which is probably preferred and all this kind of stuff. So... I was in the parking lot, and obviously I had to change my fly line after after I did this practicing. But I, long story short, over like three or four months, I kind of taught myself the basics of fly fishing, and I was by no means good. 
Um, but I, I learned enough and I had enough knowledge. So, but you know, I'd, I'd be casting out there after work. People would be driving by and like beeping at me. I'm like, hey, you should go try that in the water. All this and stuff. It's like, all right, man, whatever. So <laughs> I get ridiculed and stuff like that. It's like crazy. Like, who would do that? But anyway, so I go down and Adam was a guide at uh, Blue. Blue Horizon, I think. Blue Horizon or Blue something. Uh, Blue something Lodge in the middle of Caicos. And uh, he was a guy down there, and they're running these airboats. Um, and you're getting in these super shallow water for bone fishing. Man, I first couple of days, I think it was super windy, and I, I struck out, and I had some opportunities, and Adam was there guiding me and coaching me. But, um, you know, we, uh, we eventually got on some fish, and there was another guy out with us one day. It was in the afternoon, and I got on this flat, and it was like, mid shin deep and as far as you could see the sun was going down it was just nothing but like shining shimmery tailing fish i mean anyone could have you know a chimpanzee could have caught one of these fish like there was there were tons of them and i made a couple of false casts and i eventually plopped a fly down in front of this fish he turned and ate on it and like a kook at the time you know fly fishing is very kind of like you know quiet and stuff like that and i hooked this fish i was hooting and hollering man across the flat and i got the fish finally in and got it released he got a picture and oh man i was stoked so that was a good trip man that was my first bonefish on fly and uh it wasn't pretty but it happened and adam was there he was, he was the guide down there at, at uh at the lodge at the time and blue, that was, blue horizon i think it was blue horizon i'm not sure no no no, no 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 adam adam says it's blue horizon blue horizon yeah, yeah. so um but uh now i have yeah. a, i have a question here from Corey. uh how about the people who are disabled and seniors to have help to bring in a record-breaking fish. What's the rules on that? Is there any rules, especially for uh, seniors or the disabled? No, there's not. And this is something that's come up over the years, actually. Um, and we've done some outreach to, to different groups. This is actually before my time. This, is, this was a big issue. So I'm not 100% clear on how all the details work out. But to answer your question, no, we don't have... Uh, rule exceptions for uh, people with disabilities or anything like that. Um, but I know before my time, I want to say it might have been during Mike Leach's time as president of IGFA, this was an issue that came up. And this is kind of anecdotal and what I've heard kind of word of mouth is that there was some research that was done or some outreach uh, to groups that represent people with disabilities or whatever. And, um, and they kind of came back and said, you know, the, they prefer not to have a separate category or something like that just to, you know, be able to have a record that's the same as everyone else's or something like that. something along those lines. Um, again, this is all anecdotal. I don't I wasn't around for it, so I can't I can't say it's 100 percent accurate. But um, uh, to, to the gentleman's question, no, we, do, we don't have a separate set of rules or categories for uh, disabled anglers or anything like that. OK. All right. Uh, yeah. Corey. I, hopefully that answers you. Uh, we also have Trent Glob in the house. Trent, uh, I think it was two years ago, caught the uh, Royal Slam, all the billfish in one calendar year. So big shout out to him. All, did I say? Yeah, all I the, remember Trent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I would. It's so funny. And again, I, I'm only laughing because I didn't know he was setting out for this thing. But I'd get these messages on Instagram from Trent. I know him from the fishing club and from the derby and stuff here locally. He's like, hey, uh, who should I call to catch this fish? Uh, this is the guy I know in this location. Then before you know it, uh, I had – hold on. Your, your wind is getting pretty bad. Can you oh. t t turn the computer just yeah, – oh, perfect. All right. Uh, so – I, I give him like two or three leads on places that, you know, he should go fishing, you know, when he asked me for the species. No different than anybody else uh, throughout the year. I get these calls and direct messages constantly. And then next thing you know, I see he catches the Royal Slam. I didn't even know he was going after it. Uh, so it was, it was way cool. So uh, I'm glad that he was able to... Uh, to get his royal slam of all nine billfish species in a calendar year, so that was uh, that was pretty cool. So it's it's a great accomplishment to you know set yourself. Hey, I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna do this, and you actually go do it. So way for up. sure. Uh, Trent, Trent saying thank you, but no, no, I love telling the story because I think it's so neat. It's I had no clue. I just I thought he was going fishing. 
you know, and I'm just helping right. out. Little did I know that uh, he was actually uh, on this mission, and it was so cool to be a part of it. So, yeah, uh, man. Did I miss anything off the IGFA that you want to touch on before we uh, wrap this thing up? Or I don't think so, man. I think the main thing, with, uh, the thing I'll kind of leave you with is that for people that aren't members, and more, I guess people that are members of IGFA, thank you. And uh, we have the 2020 IGFA record book, uh, kind of like the you know the the book for recreational anglers coming out uh, any day now. So it's uh, it's finalized production which it's in the mail so if you're an igfa member check your mailbox in the coming week or so it should be there so um the 2020 record book is out um it's on the way to you and if you're not an igfa member join today uh get your record book your 2020 book and and help support some of the cool stuff that we do um or at least go online and check us out or check out facebook and, and learn a little more or, or instagram or whatever and, and learn a little bit more about us um just kind of leave it at that. You know, we uh, we're an international group and kind of speak to whether you fly fish for trout or salmon or fish for black marlin and blue marlin offshore, or whatever. Uh, we we kind of do it all. So um, so, so I, I have a world record holder right now commenting that his name is still in the book. That's uh, young Eric Leach, not so young anymore. Uh, he still has the yeah. Th- Dog tooth, yeah, is it? twenty pound dog, dog tooth. tooth to, yeah, look at man, you got this whole thing memorized. Dude. I'm telling you, man. You know what? You you really impressed me when you were throwing out all the Latin names of the tuna. Uh, I was like, wow. He, he's like, yeah, you you were breaking them down, but the dog tooth. You're like, wait a second, dog tooth, man. Uh, Trent Trent just threw this out there, and I have to. Uh, it, it's a really big deal. He's now going after the Royal Slam for his nine-year-old daughter. Uh, wow, Marlins. Yeah, she's uh, she she has three of the nine already. So, well, good luck to her, man. Trent, if you if you need any help or if we can help with anything, reach out to us, man. Absolutely, same here. Also, Steve Carson says uh, happily anticipating the 2020 record book. Uh, oh, quick question. Uh, with membership, do they get a haircut by you? <laughs> Nobody asked that. That was a question for me. I just want okay. you to know. Uh, do, if, for their membership, will you be offering up haircuts? You got to you got to you got to become a donor a donor member at like ten grand or higher for for a haircut for me, man. Damn. They're that good. They're, They're that good. Are they really? Uh, <laughs> okay, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> there's, there's a chance, dude. There's a chance. Got, everything has a price. Uh, I love it. I love it. Anyway, uh, on that note, you don't hang up. I'm going to be signing off here, but I want uh, you to stick by. Uh, Everybody, I want to say thank you so much for uh, joining in the No BS World Tour. I'm not 100% sure who I got on tomorrow. I think I was supposed to have Mike Puller, but I think we moved it uh, one day. Uh, Corey says, what's the price of being a member to the IGFA? It's fifty bucks for your annual membership, and you get uh you get your record book, uh your decals, uh your your membership ID card, membership discounts, and you uh for a limited time we're doing an offer where you get a free IGFA logo face mask like a buff kind of thing. Um, so fifty bucks for your yearly membership, and you get all the things I just mentioned. So plus you get access to your website. The oh yeah, everything on our website for sure. You get full access to. I mean. All the records, uh, all of our historic videos, all of our historic publications, all that stuff online for sure. But that's that's part of the membership as well, correct? Part of your membership. The, yeah, yeah. Part of the, it's not open to everybody. It's part of the yearly membership. Not all that stuff is open. A lot of it's behind membership only uh, kind of walls or whatever. So Okay. Um, I, yeah. I, I didn't want you to miss that part. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate no that. No worries. <laughs> Rob, Rob Lane's joining in late. Rob, we just went over every single rule held by any billfish angler. So you're going to have to rewatch this whole thing. Uh, I, I, I'm i teasing Rob because he's a, he's a great fisherman and he's very goal-oriented. So, um, I, listen, I, I know where everybody's little touch put buttons are and I like to tease everybody. So. Uh, anyway, all you cool cats and kittens... Uh, oh, wait a second. Uh, you know I went there, right? <laughs> I want to give a... I got to give a big shout out right now. Uh, Susan Carson, uh, I hope you are feeling good. 
I hope you are feeling good and healthy. Uh, and you are in my thoughts and prayers just to let you know. And oh, wait a second. Is your daughter coming out? Yeah, she's coming. Yeah. Come here. Come here. Hey, you want to see everybody? Absolutely. Hi. This is Reagan. Hi, hey, Reagan. Hi. hi. <laughs> Every oh, I love the shirt. Dream big. Oh, that's right. Absolutely. Don't ever let anybody get in the way of your big dream. I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, hi, Reagan. I have to let. Uh, I got to let you know that Rob Lane is also an IGFA lifetime member. Uh, he just let me know, so I got to give him a big shout out for that. Good man. So, <laughs> hi, Reagan. Say hi to the people. Hi. Say hi. 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 <laughs> All righty. Bye. Bye. You're not saying bye to me. You're saying bye to everybody else. All righty, everybody in the No BS World Tour land, the cool cats and kittens. I know you've seen it if you answered to that. Uh, anyway. Uh, I will come back at you tomorrow sometime around the same time. Set that notification just in case. And if you got somebody that you want me to talk to uh, on this time, let me know or have them reach out to me. So every, any, anyway, <laughs> say bye, Reagan. Bye. All righty, everybody. We will see you tomorrow. Jack, you stay right there. Don't go All nowhere. Right, guys. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll check you later.